We knew that our decision to withdraw would entail risks. Do you know what kind of regime the Taliban have been imposing on the areas they control? Public beatings and executions. In the end, it's up to the Afghan people to really decide what's their future. It's not up to us. After 20 years fighting Taliban insurgents and failing to defeat them, NATO forces are pulling out of Afghanistan. Last week, correspondents reported that more than half the country had fallen to the Taliban advance. My guest this week is Mircha Joanna, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, who joins me this week from the Alliance's headquarters in Belgium. How does he justify the abandonment of the Afghan people at a time of maximum need? Mircha Joanna, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you for having me. The war in Afghanistan may be over for NATO, but it most certainly isn't for the people of that country. What does it say about your alliance that when the mission fails, you cut and run and abandon your friends to a very dangerous future? Listen, we've been in Afghanistan for almost 20 years now. Uh, we all vividly remember 9-11. Uh, the first time that Article 5 was invoked, uh, and all allies and global partners have basically stayed for 20 years in Afghanistan. So uh, I remember, and President Biden, I think the other day, just mentioned the fact there was an attempt to put an end uh, to our presence in Afghanistan in 2011. So the 10th, if you want, anniversary uh, of our presence. So we are not running away, we are just closing a long chapter. Uh, we know that uh, putting an end to our mission is also entailing risks. We are, we are lucid about these things. But the decision to put an end at a certain point of a long protracted mission uh, was something which was taken by all, all allies, by our American friends and allies. And now we're opening a new chapter. We are yes, not but, abandoning but Mr. Afghanistan. We, we Mr. want to continue Mr. to help Afghanistan. Mr. Joanna, the fact is you're setting a very dangerous precedent for NATO, which is leaving your friends and allies at a time when they desperately need you. And I wonder if that's really a label that you want to wear around the world. We have been training um, over 300,000 Afghan military and security forces for all these years. We've invested billions of dollars or euros or whatever currency partners uh, have for their national budgets. We've been investing in this country massively, not only in security and defense, but I'm looking at the numbers. Since our presence in Afghanistan, the number of children enrolled in schools, in education, increased by 8 million, many of those young girls. How long do you think that's going helping. to last, Mr. Joanna? How long do you think you're going to last? The figures that I would like you to think of are that more than 160 out of 400 districts have been seized by the Taliban in the last two months. Key provincial cities, north and south, are under siege. Hundreds of people are dying every week. And important people in Afghanistan, professional people, women in public life, are being targeted, shot at on the streets, and their cars blown up by bombs. Those are the figures that the people in Afghanistan have to deal with now, now that you've left them. Um, General Scott Miller, the commander, stood down. He doesn't deny that they're leaving friends in need. He said, I don't like leaving friends in need. We should be concerned. The loss of terrain and the rapidity of that loss has to be concerning. You look at the security situation, it's not good. You're pushing these people we into the arms of a very cruel and very brutal, and to some people, a very primitive movement that has no regard for human rights or justice whatsoever. So we are fully aware of the situation, which is not looking great. We are also fully aware that there might be risks for reversal of some of the positive reforms that we have been encouraging over the years. We are also aware of the fact that the Afghan forces that we've been training uh, with enormous investments on our side, they also have to start performing. Some of, the, some of the losses of territory that you have mentioned are also due to the fact that there is an impact on the morale of the Afghan forces, including because of the departure of NATO and our US allies. 
Some of others are strategical because they decided, as far as we know, for them to concentrate the, the resources that they have, considerable resources that, that they have, in order to protect the more strategically relevant places. But in the end, it's not up to us to decide uh, uh, you know, the future of Afghanistan. And we hope and we encourage uh, uh, inter-Afghan peace talks, because at a certain moment, uh, the room for diplomacy uh, will arrive, and we hope it will arrive very soon. Well, there is um, enormous criticism of your withdrawal from experts, from uh, military personnel, generals who were involved in commanding forces in NATO, intelligence chief, saying that basically this is a sorry moment for Western grand strategy. We've lost the plot here. That's Lord David Richards, a former British commander of NATO forces in Afghanistan. He said a country that we promised a huge amount to faces almost certain civil war with the likelihood that the Taliban will be back to where they were in 2001. You think he doesn't know what he's talking about? He has direct experience of Afghanistan, direct experience of dealing with the Taliban. Listen, I mentioned and we mentioned very clear that we knew that our decision to withdraw would entail risks. It's a bit more than we're risks, also concerned. isn't it? It's a bit more than risks. It's risks a reality. It's, to, a, it's, to it's a murderous reality. Also to the reality. investments we have done in this country for many, many long years. But let me also say, uh, uh, you know, also, also something else. That there is, at a certain moment, a decision that is not easy. Because if we would be in this logic, we'll continue to stay on and on and on, one more year, one more year. It's already 20 years on 9-11, 2022 is 20 years. So that's a very tough choice that the American president and us in NATO have to, have to be doing. What we need now to do is to not to give up on Afghanistan, and also not even to have this kind of uh, sometimes legitimate, but sometimes exaggerated po points of concern. We believe that civil war is, is not unavoidable in Afghanistan. We believe there is a chance for peace talks to resume in Doha or elsewhere. We're also seeing regional powers also concerned you're, about you're, the risk you're, you're clutching of Afghanistan at straws, becoming- Mr. Joanna, you're clutching at straws here. Um, your summit communique last month speaks, as you said, of opening a new chapter in NATO's relationship with Afghanistan. You said, we affirm our commitment to continue to stand with the country, its people and its institutions in promoting security and upholding the hard-won gains of the last 20 years. Do you know what kind of regime the Taliban have been imposing on the areas they control? public beatings and executions, women denied basic rights, education, jobs, no freedom of speech, a justice system based on torture. Do you know what you've handed them over to, the people of Afghanistan? As I mentioned, we are fully aware of the risks that are uh, ahead of us. At the same time, let me also say something that the original purpose of our presence 20 years ago in Afghanistan is to make sure that Afghanistan is not becoming, again, a safe haven terrorism. In 20 years, there's not been not a single terrorist attack from Afghanistan on NATO soil. This is, in itself, one of the primary goals of our presence there. Again, this is something that we are fully supportive of a future of Afghanistan that they will decide together we believe that some of the reforms that we have uh, contributed to would also be defended, not only in military terms, but also defended by the Afghan people themselves. So I do not believe that there is today a chance for some form of Taliban rule that will be taking control over the whole country. I believe there is enough uh, capacity in that country to, to defend this hardly uh, uh, gained uh, uh, progress in social and human, human rights. But in the end, it's up to the Afghan people to really decide what's their future. I, it's I not up just, to us yeah. in perpetuity to decide on behalf of the Afghan people. I want and to, we do I believe, want... and I'm, I'm, I strongly believe, I strongly believe that there will be some form of political settlement among the, the, the various constituencies, ethnic groups, and also uh, philosophies and ideologies inside Afghanistan. Well, this is the purpose of the inter-Afghan talks. Well, that let, we me encourage just, let, and we let, let me just point out um, some of the comments that uh, disagree with that enormously. 
in particular from the former head of Britain's secret intelligence service, Alex Younger, who stood down last year. And he said he was frustrated by the way we, we, the international community, have failed. We have failed to match our ambitions with a proper political plan. That's his view. And his view is also that there is a perfectly cordial relationship between the Taliban and al-Qaeda. And he's predicting that Afghanistan will likely descend into civil war. You point out that there haven't been any terrorist attacks from Afghanistan the time that NATO has been there. He says neither Islamic State nor al-Qaeda have gone away. And now they have a good chance to come back. You happy about that? This is another expert. Do you not think he knows what he's talking about as well? When I mentioned that we are ending a chapter in our relationship with Afghanistan, I speak on behalf of NATO this time, and opening a new one, doesn't mean that we are leaving Afghanistan with our military presence and not continue to support Afghanistan, including its security and military forces. The NATO Trust Fund for Afghanistan's armed forces is fully replenished up to 2024, billions of dollars that we have at our disposal to continue to train. Of course, not in, in, in country. There are also allies, America first and foremost, that are now looking and, and preparing uh, over the horizon, as we call them, military and, and, and air capabilities to be able to intervene in, in case of need. So how, how I think that this they, idea they, that they we are leaving... They have a case of need now. They're not intervening now, but there's a lightning advance going on by the uh, Taliban. I, I, Where is the I intervention? Would, I, would, I would politely disagree because there's also public reports that there is, we continue to give support to the Afghan armed forces. We continue to help them run their air force, which is quite performant, by the way. We continue to train their special forces, uh, which are quite performant, by the way. Of course, we know that in some portions of Afghanistan, we, we also have the same information and even more intel that there are some problems with the morale of the troops. Some of them are, 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 are taking refuge in neighboring countries, in Tajikistan, in other places. We are not in the situation to ignore the reality, which is a hard reality. But this in the end, the moment of our ending of our mission in Afghanistan would have come. Is that a perfect moment for that? No, it isn't. Is this the great solution? No, it isn't. This is one of the options that we have on our hand to continue to help Afghanistan. Yes, it is. That, and I'm, it, I'm also a, encouraged a, of the fact that also other international players, not only NATO, not only the US, not only the UK, not only Germany or Italy uh, or Turkey, uh, the, the, Joanna, the leading uh, ally Joanna, nations in Afghanistan, it's, it's we are encouraging tribute, international dialogue on that. It's not a great tribute when the best thing that Joe Biden can say about your mission is that it hasn't failed yet. You think withdrawing all the troops and leaving the country to be overrun by the Taliban enhances your partnership with Afghanistan? I'm not sure how you work that out. We, NATO, continue to support the ongoing Afghan-led peace process, you say. What process is that? You know perfectly well that there haven't been any sustained talks between the government and the Taliban for months. Sometimes the Taliban turn up to talk, sometimes they don't. Why construct these fairy tale scenarios that have absolutely nothing to do with reality? The peace process will resume. And the peace process is not always resuming as we would have hoped. Also because there is, like always in a negotiation, uh, at least two parties. The Afghan legitimate government, and sometimes the Afghan government has not shown up to these negotiations. Sometimes the Taliban are playing this well, game. Well, they were excluded from but the we deal see. that the Americans did, weren't they? The, the government of Afghanistan we, was excluded completely from the deal. So this was always going to end see. badly. The deal contained no assurances whatsoever about democracy or a constitution or elections or anything else that might help people to hope, as you put it, hope that the gains of the last 20 years could be somehow retained. Nothing. Let me put, put it differently then, because I, 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 I hear you. This is things that we are also concerned about. But here there are two options. There's no way in which the Taliban can take over control over the whole country. Because there are other constituencies and other forces that would not allow that. So there's no way for the Taliban to take over by force the whole of Afghanistan. We also are aware of the fact that having Afghanistan going back to the period when the factions uh, and, and, and some form of, of, of long-term uh, uh, you know, infighting inside the country is also not a solution, nor for the Taliban, nor for the other forces. 
So there will be a political compromise to be met. Is this the right time? We hope it is. Is this only the role of the US and NATO to encourage both parties to, to join again negotiations in Doha or elsewhere? No. This is why we see uh, interesting uh, uh, you know, um, uh, encouragement for parties to resume talks uh, also by, by Russia, also by China, also by other neighboring players. So I think nobody, but nobody from the international community is interested in having Afghanistan going that devastating road that they had uh, 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 many years ago. Well, without, so all of us, the international forces community, that have just left, have without the forces Afghanistan. that have just left, they may not be able to prevent it. Mr. John, I come back to the they question should. of they NATO's, Tim. NATO's Tim, credibility. Should. Can we just discuss NATO's credibility after this withdrawal, not just in Central Asia, but around the world? Leaving friends in need, and those are the words of General Scott Miller, leaving friends in need severely damages your credibility at a time when you really need it. How much value do you think Ukraine, for instance, places on your messages of support when it watches you give up on Afghanistan and pull out, leaving it to the Taliban? I'm not here to, to, to have an, an argument over this. I'm saying that 20 years is a long period of time in staying in one place. And had trillions of dollars and thousands of lives of allied troops and our partners globally that have also sacrificed alongside with Afghans in these 20 years. Tim, 20 years. And we can, we, if you want, we can have counterfactual thing. We could continue. We should have left, left probably earlier. Is there the right moment to do this? No, it isn't. Is this a moment when we have to, to make up a decision? Yes, it is. And it's up to all of us, including the, and mainly the people of Afghanistan, to really decide what's the future. And of course, we are interested about NATO's reputation. We are, we are a strong military alliance. We, we know that sometimes our actions or inactions are, are, are also having an impact. I'm not concerned to, 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 to tell you the whole truth that our reputation as an alliance will be diminished by this. We've been staying for 20 years. There's no other similar situation when a global alliance around the nations from all, all, all the continents, not only NATO countries, we have come to the help of our American friends and allies. All right, my, 20 my, years, my question, My question, Mr. Joanna, was what you thought Ukraine might make of all this considering that they're also in receipt of very nice words and promises from NATO, like NATO's support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity is unwavering, when in practical terms, that's actually meaningless, isn't it? Because NATO can do nothing to prevent Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity being violated wholesale by Russia, as it has been since 2014. So nice yes, words. Yes, Tim, but to... Nice words. Is, is, is not is that only what words. you want to be known for? Nice words? Absolutely just the opposite. What I'm saying, we cannot compare uncomparable things. Afghanistan is not Ukraine. And that's a totally different uh, uh, ball game and, and, and story behind these two, these two situations. Well, let me be specific. And when let we me, say, let remember, me be remember the, 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 the older generations, speaking of the annexation, illegal annexation of Crimea. Do we remember when the Baltic states were annexed by Soviet Union? Was the same words as you mentioned now, that when the US and Western Europe at that time in, in small NATO in those days, they said they will never recognize the annexation of the Baltic states to Soviet Union. This can take time. It took decades. We needed to wait for the end of the Cold War and today, the Baltic nations are proud members of our alliance. I know in your interviews with, with my colleagues, with Jess Torterberg and my predecessor, uh, uh, Rose Gottemoller, you asked the question, can we really defend these countries? Our allies, yes. Do we have an obligation towards Ukraine in terms of Article 5? Not yet. But when and if we'll have that decision, we'll also defend all allies. Today, there are 30 allies that we have promised solemnly to defend one another. Mr. So, Joanna, you, you... I know that sometimes words mean not to be strong enough, Tim. But they mean something. They mean political commitment from the leaders. And the moment we have decided in our NATO summit in June, on June 14th that we'll continue to help Afghanistan, that we'll continue to stand by the sovereignty 
and territorial integrity of Ukraine and Georgia, for that matter, that will say that we'll be helping our partners around the world. That's NATO's reputation. This is Mr. what we what Mr. we are doing, Mr. not to find. You don't need not me to, to fight tell you. prolonged, you, protracted wars. You don't need me to tell you that the Ukrainian government is waiting for a date for full membership. The foreign minister said that just a few days ago. We would like to have an honest answer to the question when. That's what he said. What is the answer? What is the answer? Tim, Can he have that answer? Tim, let, when? let me give you let me give you an indirect uh, answer, but nonetheless very direct answer. I come from Romania. I'm the first deputy secretary of NATO from a newcomer into NATO. I was foreign minister of my country. I was ambassador in Washington, trying to convince the allies to invite my country to join NATO. Did anybody tell us when this will happen? Did anybody give us a solemn promise that by that date you'll be a member of NATO, you Romania, you Bulgaria, you the Baltic states, you the others? No. They're fighting a we war with to believe. Russia on their border, Mr. Joanna. It's we a slightly also, different situation. We, we have been with Russia on situation. our borders. We have been on the, on the, on the border with Russia uh, directly or indirectly, like the Baltic countries, for many, many decades. This is not an easy thing. What I'm saying, that the Bucharest decision on open doors is there to stay. It was reconfirmed at our summit. And it's also up to us to reach consensus within the alliance and also for our friends in Ukraine to continue the path of reform. You're not going to give them a firm answer. Because what? You're time, afraid of Russia's at this reaction? Point, at, at this, You're afraid of Russia's at this point reaction? In, at this point in time, we are working on open door policy. Our foreign ministers will be meeting next December to, to give additional support to our aspirant countries. They have to keep faith in their own decision to join the West. They have to continue to invest in reforms in Ukraine, not for the sake of joining NATO or the European Union for that matter, but for the sake of Ukrainian people. And this is why uh, I'm, I'm adamant against the idea that Russia can have a veto or we can accept ever in Europe again spheres of influence and when a sovereign nation is barred from joining the kind of military alliances or the kind of structures they want to join. Well, if some Ukraine would argue, some would wants argue to stay that, that westward, Moscow has actually enforced that bar very effectively. But in the short time that we have left, I'd like to talk just briefly about China, because the recent NATO summit prioritized what you called Beijing's coercive policies and the increasing dangers it poses to the West. Your boss, Jens Stoltenberg, said these challenges had to be answered. How? How do you propose to answer these challenges? I remember being new on the job that the first time that we had a mention, uh, an explicit reference to China in an official NATO document was in London in 2019, when our leaders met. It was the first time that in a final communique, China was mentioned. And to put it in a very simple way, we presented China, which is the reality, as an opportunity and a challenge. And we started to work on the rise of China, because the rise of China is a reality that is shifting global uh, balance of power. It's also a massive opportunity that's a big country with a big economy with lots of opportunities to do things. Also, there is a challenge because China is becoming a massively, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, and aggressively uh, investing in their, in their military capabilities and their posture globally. So yes, we are working on what we call strands of work but there's also a challenge, there's also you a challenge the language, inside your alliance because there are plenty of your members who don't like this new focus on China. President Macron, for instance, was pretty clear. He said NATO is an organization that concerns the North Atlantic. China has little to do with the North Atlantic. It's important that we don't scatter ourselves and that we don't bias our relationship with China. We should avoid distracting NATO, which already has many challenges. Do you agree with him that China is a distraction for NATO? I agree uh, with what our leaders, all our leaders, including the French president, the German chancellor, the American president, the president of Romania, they all agreed on the language in our final communique team. Nobody was forcing but those countries in president a way. We negotiated Macron something. Said immediately afterwards, it's important that we don't scatter ourselves and bias our relationship That's fine. with China. That's fine. We continue to, to be a regional organization by UN standards. We are a Euro-Atlantic organization. But the rise of China is a global thing. Oh, okay. Uh, the language 
that also Beijing has criticized in our final communique is, is, is lighter than the EU language on China. And the EU language on China, official language of EU on China, that they see China as a systemic rival. Okay. I think it's much harsher in terms of, and that's again, President Macron, again, uh, other European... Mr. Joanna, we're, we're, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Thank you very much for being on Conflict Zone. I Thank appreciate you so your much. time. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you.